Well, I am holding in my hand the key product of the American frontier, the white-tailed deerskin. It's the reason that the long hunters traveled west and stayed gone away from their families for so long. Today on the Deerskin Diary, I'm going to show you my process for brain tanning a raw doe skin into a brain tan hide that we can use for clothing. So stick around. We're preserving leather and the past. Today on the Deerskin Diary. Now I'm back in suburbia filming this video because that's where all of my infrastructure is and that's okay because I'm not trying to show you how an 18th century person would have conducted this skill. As a matter of fact, I'm not even entirely sure that most 18th century backcountry Europeans really knew how to do this skill or did it a lot even if they knew. I am more trying to show you my process to produce an 18th century product that I can then use to further additional 18th century educational goals. To start this process, I've got my hide here. It's turned flesh side up, and I have my fleshing knife, right? And uh, it's got two different curvatures you can see here. Um, this outside curvature, I find that I tend to gouge into the hide and leather itself with this, so I tend to use the inside curve a little bit more. And this is gonna be used to push all this fat and meat off of this hide. We have to get all of that off in order to um, expose this inside of the hide to uh, the tanning process, which is going to come later. Now one of the things that I wanted to do in this video is talk about some of the things that used to scare me about this, some of the barriers that kept me from trying it out for myself. I mean, I thought at any point I could easily ruin the process. And I guess while that's true to some extent, really it takes a lot to, uh, to ruin the hide. So I've got a nice fleshing knife now. I actually got this one for Christmas a couple years ago, but when I first started, I was using a draw knife and I just made it a little bit more dull but I wound up gouging the hide in several places and I just didn't get quite the quality from the finished product that I wanted. It's kind of hard to mess one of these up. If you cut it, you can always restitch the hole. If you gouge it, you can work around that in your finished product if it even shows. The main thing though is getting all the meat and the fat off in this stage. Next, we're going to take the hair off. We've got the hide fleshed. Now it's time to get the hair off. There are a couple of different ways that we can do that. I use three processes at separate times. The easiest of which is nothing more than water. And with this water, we're soaking the deer hide uh, in plain water. We're trying to time the rot process so that we catch it at the very beginning where it's just beginning to attack that hair and membrane that we're trying to get off the hide. The danger in this process is that if you let it go too far, if you run out of time, you forget to check on the hide, um, then you, will, you may rot it past the point of being able to save it. Secondly, I am on municipal water here, which has a higher chlorine content, and it takes me a little bit longer with just water to, uh, to, to start to rot that hide um, because the chlorine in the water is actively preventing the good bacteria that we need to start that process. A traditional method is hardwood ash and water, and we're trying to make a base or alkaline solution to uh, remove that hair and make that membrane swell up a good bit uh, so we can see it while we remove it with that fleshing knife. I have found that it has stained the membrane side of, uh, of hides before. It has discolored it a little bit. It doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, it's part of, uh, part of the original brain tanning process and really one of the easiest methods that I've used is just adding calcium hydroxide to the water. I don't really have a ratio that I prefer. I just sort of add it. A lot of it depends on the hide and the amount of water that it takes to fully submerge the hide. But I just add it till I get a, a, a base solution um, that, that looks good to me. And then I uh, just simply submerge the hide, use a couple of clean rocks or bricks to keep the hide um, fully submerged throughout all of these processes and uh, then just kind of wait for the hair start to start to slip. We're gonna use just plain old water for this one and when we pick it back up, 
The hide's gonna be on the fleshing beam and we'll start that hair removal process. vast amount of hair that's underneath my fleshing beam. All this has come from the dehairing process and I've actually picked up most of the hair from each hide and put it in a trash bag for the trash, but there's still just tons that remains. In Stephen Ronella and Clay Newcomb's new book called The Long Hunters that came out in January of this year, you can download it on Audible and listen to it. They actually talk about a, uh, a station camp location where there was so much deer hair in the ground it was discovered during the construction of a church and then ultimately remembered, if my memory serves me correctly, by another long hunter. So just a fascinating piece of history that I'm uh, replicating in my own suburban backyard. Now congratulations, when you get a hide to this state which has been fleshed and dehaired and then air dried, you have rawhide, which is a type of finished product that can be used for several things. Now Nathan Boone talked about uh, Daniel Boone, his father, when they would do what's called half dress the hides. And his definition of half dressed was getting a hide to this state here and then working it loose just a little bit so that it could be packaged more easily for shipment back east and then eventual shipment overseas. Now, half dressing a hide can get you uh, a workable material for other things. This is a tump line. This was made by my friend uh, David McClanahan. And what he does is take that raw hide and works it over a tree branch or some sort of horizontal surface until it becomes semi-pliable like this and it has long tails here that I can use to tie up a blanket roll, carry firewood, any of those things. So if you can't get your hide past that, that raw hide state or you just don't have the time or you're just still a little squeamish about trying it, Stick with rawhide, right? Try something out of that. Use what you have, it's what they did, and it helps us get just a little bit closer to the 18th century mindset. All right, so I decided to change my mind on something. The hide that I have fleshed and dehaired, I'm actually just gonna let air dry and put in my garage, let it turn to rawhide, and I can tan it at a later date. I've selected a hide that I had previously, a couple of years ago, dehaired and uh, fleshed out to brain tan for this process. Now I used wood ashes on this hide so it's got some discoloration to it. Um, and it's also less than perfect in the sense that it has gouge marks from the draw knife I was using at the time. Um, but I wanna use that to make a pair of moccasins in a future video. And I want a less than perfect hide for my moccasins since it's gonna be footwear. But I also wanna show that, hey, none of this has to be perfect. You can mess up the process along the way and still come out with a product that you can use to make something else. There's nothing to be scared of. It's just hard work and a little bit of thought and plenty of effort. And you too can get the same results. So the next thing I need to do is make my brain water mixture for the soaking and wringing of the hide and for that I have about a gallon or so no more than a gallon of hot water I don't use boiling water I use it just uh, it's just hot enough where I put my hand in it I don't want to leave it in there for more than a second or two and uh, of course the brains themselves now these are pork brains I buy these at an ethnic market uh, they come in the uh, one pound packaging like this and they're perfect for one hide now i should add here you cannot overbrain the hide right at least i've never been able to do that uh, but you can absolutely underbrain it uh, pretty consistently so i like to use an entire pound of brain per hide a lot of people will say that's probably excessive and wasteful but uh, i find that it, it takes account of of my time later on and I don't have to go back and potentially rebrain and restretch quite as much. In order to make this brain solution, all I'm going to do is take the hot water pour it in the bucket and add the brains. Now 
Now here's a stage where a lot of people will use a blender, maybe a stick blender or a regular like kitchen blender. Um, I just use the stick and stir it up really well. I want to get the big chunks broken up in the water as much as I can. The more you can emulsify it, I have found the better it works, but I've also found that the more you use your kitchen blender for blending brains for brain tanning, the more likely you'll be to sleep on the couch. Here we have the brain water mixture. I've got it stirred up and dissolved as best I can. Here we have that hide that we've rehydrated and we've wrung out and allowed to air dry until it's no longer uh, soaking wet and just damp to the touch. And all we're gonna do is put it in there and submerge it. Let it start soaking up some of that brain solution. And once that happens, we'll turn the camera back on and we'll go wring it out. All right, now I'm gonna show you the wringing process. For that, I have this horizontal plastic piece. I think this was either a piece of PVC pipe or an extension for a um, shop back. I don't remember which, but I've just got it mounted to a tree and to a fence post over here. And it's a nice, clean, uh, horizontal surface. So I don't have to worry about paint transfer from a, a I like to say an iron gate or something like that leaching into the hide. Now this is a very important piece here for the next process or this ringing process because we need a hard stable platform for the hide to push up against to expel the water from inside the hide through to the outside of the hide and that's the tanning process taking place. We're going to see if we can capture some of that on camera. Next thing I'm going to do is get the hide out of the brain solution and I'm gonna drape it over this horizontal piece, but I'm gonna do that so that the hide is almost in thirds. So I've got the top third here, the front third, if you will, and then I've got the bottom two thirds, and I wanna roll them over the beam like so, and then I want to start rolling the hide back in on itself into a donut. This being the flesh side, this being the hair side. Or the outside being the hair side. And I'm gonna continue rolling this into a donut as best I can. The discoloration on the flesh side from this particular deer hide is from the wood ashes and water that I used um, to, to de-hair the hide. It's not the prettiest, but this hide I'm gonna use for moccasins. So to be honest with you, um, this is a really good one to try to brain on camera in case it all goes wrong. I'm not entirely worried about the um, overall smoothness of the finished product. This being used for moccasins, it can be a little, I don't know, crunchier or crustier if you will. It doesn't have to be that perfectly um, appearing hide. It just needs to be thick enough and strong enough to make a pair of shoes. Now that I've got the hide rolled into this donut shape, the next thing I want to do is to take uh, a hardwood uh, handle like this is what I use. You could use anything uh, that, that was similar. This is an old hickory uh, tomahawk handle, but it's perfect as a ringer. And I'm just going to put it into this void here in the donut that we created, and I'm going to begin to twist. And what that's going to do is ring the hide out. And I'm going to repeat this process numerous, numerous times, probably uh, five, six, or seven times. I prefer to just go big or go home on the first braining to try to get as much of that brain uh, and water mixture that has the lecithin in it that acts as the tanning agent to push its way all the way through these layers of leather and penetrate all of those fibers. Let's see how we do. say here too that I've got the bucket underneath it to catch as much of the drippings as we can because we can continue to reuse those throughout the entire process. And there's no reason to be gentle with the hide at this point. I am putting a lot of energy and effort into wringing this hide out because we want to force that liquid all the way through the various layers. So now that I have the hide uh, wrung out for the first time, there's a couple cool little things that uh, will help spawn your encouragement as you, uh, as you proceed. So if you look here, 
you will see how this is sort of uh, still translucent almost from the rawhide process. But now that I've introduced the brains to it, watch what happens when I, when I stretch it, right? It begins to turn. This one still needs more braining, but you can see it actually begin to turn white as I add tension and pressure through the stretching process. And what that's doing is taking those fibers that are kind of glued together like this, and it's beginning to pull them apart and separate them. And uh, that is the softening process at work once the, hand, once the hide rather is fully tanned. Now, the problem is, I already know this isn't enough brains for this hide. It's a fairly thick hide. Um, I've got all kinds of nonsense on the back here. This is um, extra membrane that I just didn't take the time to get off because I knew what this hide was gonna become. At the end, I just didn't spend a whole lot of time on it um, because it's not of, of garment quality. Um, and I'm okay with that. So that means though that I still need to rebrain this thing several times so I get it uh, fairly soft before I begin the stretching process. So right back into the bucket it goes and uh, I'm gonna be spending some more time getting this hide nice and brained up and ready for stretching. Now I want to take a second to talk about uh, a lot of these imperfections and all that I've left on this hide. One of the reasons I wanted to select a less than perfect hide is to show people out there who have never done this that it's probably not going to turn out perfect, but it will still turn out okay. And it is not perfection that we're striving for on these first few attempts. It is a finished product that you can be proud of and do something with. Everyone has to start somewhere and you can see I'm in the middle of my suburban backyard. I'm using all modern equipment, stuff that I've repurposed from other areas to try to replicate this much earlier even than an 18th century skill. But I'm doing it because it expands my horizons. I'm doing it because it gives me a sense of accomplishment when I can complete this ancient process and, and, and actually fabricate something out of the material when I'm finished and also to extend a little bit more of my 18th century experience when I can't be in 18th century clothing and out reproducing 18th century uh, vignettes or moments in time. <laughs> So I've just done the second braining and wringing of the hide. It's already starting to become softer and more velvety. Again, uh, these are like these little um, gimmies during the process that encourage you to go on. There will be some setbacks, but uh, it's all good. doesn't matter. It'll work itself out. And uh, one key that I want to note here is that, uh, like, I've got to go to work here in just a little bit. So I'm just doing some of this before, uh, before I have to go to work. At any point in this process, I can put this in a plastic bag and throw it in the refrigerator for a day or two or put it in the freezer for, for up to several months and, uh, and be able to come back and pick it up and just sort of proceed as I can. And uh, that's something that we have in the 21st century that our, our forefathers and forebears didn't have. And so I'm gonna rebrain this thing three or four more times and then probably stick it in a gallon size Ziploc bag Throw it in the refrigerator and pick it up tomorrow or the next day. I've got my deer hide here. It's been brained four or five times. If I had a little bit more time, I'd probably keep going. 
but truthfully, I also want to see if I can figure out, uh, based on the hide in this stage, whether or not it's been brained in, in, enough or not. I don't know if I can. I, I kind of doubt it, but uh, it's the learning process, right? And so uh, all I have to do is start stretching this hide, and if it starts to stiffen up, I throw it in a plastic bag in the refrigerator or the freezer, and I start over. I've got plenty of brains. Um, I'm going to stretch a little bit on this cable. It's attached uh, in two places to the tree itself, and it's fairly loose in the center. The very last part of this process is smoking the hide. And what that does is it imparts that wood smoke into the fibers of the hide. It coats those fibers of the hide and it prevents them from being able to shrink back into their rawhide state if the deer skin gets wet. Now, we need to do both sides and that's what's gonna give this leather it's a traditional golden or brown buckskin color. It's also what's gonna give it something that you won't be able to experience over uh, a video, and that's the, the campfire smell that brain tan buckskin is known for. Got my deer hide spread out on my table. Uh, nothing but the best here in the Deerskin Diary whimsical backyard. Um, I've got some string that I'll use to suspend the hide. I use several small pieces of river cane like this and I'll tie the string in the center um, and this will act as a hanger for the hide which we're going to fold into a tube and secure using these clothespins. Now a lot of people will actually glue the edge of the hide with Elmer's glue and then clothespin it also. Um, I've never actually done that. I have had good success with clothespins by themselves. I have a ton of them here and I just seal the hide up to try to keep all the smoke inside of it. The last thing that I want to use here in my equipment list is this old towel and I will create a skirt along the bottom of the hide with that towel and it just provides another degree of separation from uh, the fire itself or the low burning coals and the, uh, the heat from the metal of this particular smoker that I'm using. So to fuel the fire, all I use is charcoal um, or some embers from a fire. I don't want any flame in there. I just want a really low heat. And I use some of this punk wood. I'm getting it off the outside of this log today. Uh, I think this is an old piece of walnut right here that, uh, that I inherited. And I'm just picking off the outside and I get these little chunks and they don't burn. They provide a good smoke.
here it is, folks. A brain tan and freshly smoked deer skin. It's got beautiful color on both sides of the hide. It is ready for our next project and our next video, which is going to be a pair of center seam Seminole or Muskogee Creek style moccasins. So stick around. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you spending your time with me and your patience through this video as I film in the uh, noise pollution ridden area of suburbia but I want to get this information out so that anybody that's out there that's anxious to try this but maybe has a couple of barriers or concerns hey if I can do this here in the middle of my own backyard I guarantee you can do it too and you'll come up with a product that you're proud of we'll see you next time on the Deerskin Diary